If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. The last several weeks I've noticed a trend even among Christians. And because our lives are so radically different and there are things we used to could do that we can no longer do, there are things we didn't used to be afraid to do that now we have to ask ourselves the question, should I be afraid or in fear over this particular issue? And what it has caused people to do is become more and more depressed. And so as I see more and more people out that I know are believers, they love Jesus Christ with all their heart, but they're living in such fear and they're so depressed, we need hope. And chapter 30, I think, brings us the hope that we need, not only that Israel and Judah needed, but it's the hope that we need. In fact, the the chapter 30 is really what's called a book of consolation. It's all about God. And so I want us to begin and remember that Jeremiah chapter 30 through 33 is actually known as the book of consolation or the book of comfort. And here Jeremiah sees hope. He sees healing and he sees rehabilitation of Judah and of Israel. He speaks of a spiritual renewal of their minds and of their hearts. And if there's that one thing we need in America today, we need a spiritual renewal of our mind and of our heart. How can we expect lost people to do any different than lost people do if we as the church, the body of Christ, are renewing our minds and renewing our hearts? He reminds them that God does not remember their sins anymore. God has chosen to put their sin out of the way and and to forget their sin. He tells them about a new covenant and a restoration to the land. This new covenant, though, it actually cleanses them and causes them to prosper. The main idea expressed here is that Yahweh, the God of covenant, is also Yahweh, the God of comfort. He disciplines his people when he absolutely has to, but he does not forsake them. Now, there is a big difference in being disciplined. It's an entirely different matter to be forsaken. God will discipline his children when he has to. When we don't repent, when we don't turn back to him, but he will never forsake us. He has never forsaken his people. He never will forsake his people. He makes promises to them and he keeps his promise. And in chapter 30, we see the beauty of God keeping his promise to Israel, who was was so down in the dumps, if you will, because of being deported out of Israel and out of Judah and into Babylon. Chapter 30 makes it clear that God has a mission for his people. And he will continue to work through them and in them to accomplish his plan. In the first three verses, we see God's instructions for Jeremiah to write a book. Here's what God is doing. He is clearly documenting for them and for us the hope that he has in store for his people. And I think we can find that same hope today. Let's look at the first three verses to begin with. And notice what he says here. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. No doubt this message brings great hope to the people, but oh, how much better it is when we look at Ezra and we look at Nehemiah and we see the actual restoration of those kingdoms. When we see that taking place, we realize that is actual evidence that God not only has promised something, but he's keeping his promise. And so we see those that are here today and we think about what we're living in. Those who are true believers in Jesus Christ, we talk about Emmanuel, the Messiah, God Almighty, we would even call him El Shaddai because he is our all-sufficient God. He has made promises to you and he has made promises to me. And make no mistake about it, he will keep his promise. We may not see his promise when we want to see it or his, his completion of it, but he will complete his promise. He always has and he always will. I want you to look in verses 1 through 3. God commissions the book of consolation. It says, A word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Now, we know in Jeremiah 32, 1 and 2, it actually gives us the time of this prophecy in this book covering these four chapters from chapter 30 through chapter 33. It takes place right before the final fall of Jerusalem. The general tone is one of hopefulness. Optimism sets out in chapter 30 from all the different chapters that we've seen so far. The historical context is clearly indicated in Jeremiah 32, verse 1. This was in the final stages of that 18-month siege 
which wound up in the destruction not only of the, te- of the city, but also of the temple. This is when the Babylonians came in and they just raised everything. The situation, humanly speaking, could not have been any dimmer, could not have been any worse. And God comes in this dark time and says, here's the hope and here is the deliverance. He says, write a book, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is commanded to write the prophecy. Now, no doubt, we have the whole book of Jeremiah, so we know that Jeremiah recorded all. But this is something different. This is God wanting to speak to Israel, God wanting to speak to Judah, God wanting to speak to us today as a reminder, I have made promises to you, but I am the God of promise. I will keep my promises. And so this book here, these four chapters, is very, very special. He says, I will also bring them back to the land which I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Now, this is a promise that's stated many times before and after this passage in Jeremiah. Yet it's a prophecy, and it develops a clear theme throughout the captivity is you will go into captivity, but you will come back. And so God is promising them here, you will come back from the Babylonian exile. And this is indicated in the last words of this chapter. Notice what he says here, in the latter days. Now, something I need to share with you, and that's this. There are a lot of the prophets, Ezekiel does it, Jeremiah does it, Isaiah does it, uh, and they'll be speaking to a particular time, to, to a particular point, but they mean something well beyond that. And Jeremiah here is talking about the deliverance of those, those Israelites and those, the tribe of Judah that was taken into Babylonian and Assyrian captivity. You guys are coming home. That is a promise that he's talking about here. You're coming back. You're going to rebuild the city. But he's talking about something much, much more than that. And we'll see this as we look at it. Because notice he says, in the latter days... You will consider, that's in verse 24, what he's saying here, he says, this prophecy is for you, Israel, it's for you, Judah, but it's beyond that, there's, there's, there's promises I haven't even made to you yet that I'm going to fulfill in the future, and we'll see that as this text unveils. So this, this has two meanings. It has the meaning for Israel and for Judah that is for them, for God's people, but it's then also talking about the future. In verses 4 through 7, notice that God delivers the book in the midst of pain, now, we want to avoid pain if we can. We want to, Lord, would you just deliver me? I mean, there's nobody who would say, Lord, let me go through the seven years of tribulation and then come get me. Everybody I know says, Lord, if you, if you would, come get me at the beginning. You know, let me, let me avoid this. But in this particular passage, God makes it clear that Israel and Judah is going through a time of pain. And when he says he's going to deliver you out from that, he's not talking about I'm going to deliver you from the pain, but from the midst of all that's going on, from the midst of all that pain that you're going in, and all that terror and all that fear, I'm going to remove you out of that. I'm going to deliver you from it. Notice verse 4. And now these are the words which the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard the sound of terror and of dread. There is no peace. And ask and see if a male can give birth. Now, that's a strange question. Ask and see, can a male give birth? Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have their faces all turned pale? Alas, for that day is great, and there is none like it. It is a time of Jacob's distress or Jacob's trouble but he will be saved from it or out from it. Now, the word day here in Scripture often refers to a succession of time, a whole series of events, if you will. And what Jeremiah is actually talking about here, when he says in this day or at this time, he's talking about the time when Jerusalem would be destroyed and when it would be rebuilt. He's talking about a specific thing, but he's going beyond that because he's also talking about the time of the Great Tribulation, a time of of Jacob's trouble. And when he uses the word Jacob here, he's talking to Israel and Judah both. He says they're going to be saved out of this trouble, but it will be an experience. It will be a gruesome, a horrible experience that they will have to go through. But God will save them out of it. Some people might think that today we're already in a time of great trouble. That's not what he's talking about here. It will get much, much, much greater before he comes back for us. But here when he's talking to them, he says, you're going to be in this pain and in the suffering, and I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to complete what I promised. And we'll see that in Ezra and in Nehemiah. That will have taken place. But he says, also, there's some more promises I have for you that, I will, t- that will come to pass when we, at the end of time. Notice here he said, concerning Israel and Judah, he says, I've heard the sound of terror. I've heard the dread. There is no peace. Jeremiah, poetically here, is describing the terror of the Jewish people. They're under great calamity. 
The picture of men holding their thighs as though they're in anguish trying to give birth to a child. He says, why is this taking place? Every one of you have turned pale. In other words, he's painting a picture here. You are in pain. There is agony in your life. And this is what you're, this is, this is the way that he sees it. And he says, in that great day, the idea of that great day, again, as I shared, it comes at the very end of time. So God has made promise to, to Israel and to Judah. He will fulfill them through Nehemiah and through Ezra. We know that those are completed, but also we know that there are more promises that will be completed at the end of time. The word near, for example, and the, and the word quickly. Zephaniah in chapter 1, verse 14, he says, Near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen to the day of the Lord. It is the warrior who cries out bitterly. Now, when we think about the great day of the Lord, he says it's coming quickly. We think that if, the, well, if I said to you today, the Lord is coming quickly, that means he's probably coming maybe today or tomorrow, next week, next month, certainly within a year from now, if he's coming quickly. That's not what he's talking about. What it means is suddenly. In other words, when he does come, there's not going to be a lot of advance warning. He's not going to send out some ambassadors, say, okay, guys, I'm coming down in one year. Get ready. Three months later, okay, he's coming down. It says when he gets ready, when he gets ready to fulfill this, it will happen quickly. It is a swift uh, event that takes place. And that's what Nehemiah or Jeff, Zephaniah is saying. This day will come quickly. It will be very swift. Revelation 6, 17 says, For the great wrath of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand it? And in Revelation 16, 14 says, Gather them together for war for that great day of the Lord, the Lord Almighty. And so here he says, this day I'm talking to you about, the day of Jacob's trouble. It's a day, notice it says, there's none like it. Jesus also talked about a day there was none like it. In compare, there's nothing to compare to it. In, in Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, Then there will be great tribulation such as has been never seen since the beginning of the world until now, nor shall there ever be. In other words, there's been nothing like it. There never shall be anything like it. When the, when the great tribulation comes, when the time of Jacob's trouble comes, you will know that that's what you're in. And he says, I'm going to deliver you from what you're in now. And he did. We know that through Scripture. But I'm also going to deliver you in that which is to come. So that which is to come, I'm going to deliver you from also. And he even defines it for us. And like I said in verse 24, he says, For in the last days you'll understand. You'll comprehend then. You'll know then. If we were in the last days and it seems like we may be, he says, you'll know, you'll understand. That's one of the reasons we see the signs of the times, and nobody knows when the Lord's coming back. If there, I remember a, a preacher wrote a book back in 1988. He said, 88 reasons, actually wrote in 87, he said, 88 reasons that Jesus is coming back in 1988. And he sent it out to all kinds of pastors and all kinds of churches. I got a copy of it, and I read it, and I thought, well, I know he's a false prophet because the Bible says no man knows. Only the Father in heaven. So, but by the way, another guy in 1989 wrote 89 reasons Jesus didn't come back in 1988. Um, that's not a preacher story. That's a true story. And, uh, but so nobody knows. But he says you know the seasons. And when we re and if you're in church today, if you remember here, you know we went through Revelation. It took almost a whole year just going through Revelation uh, up through last December. And remember when, when he's talking about all the things that are happening, it looks to me like we're on the precursor of what's about to happen. And, I mean, it's like we're on the edge of eternity. Now, I don't know that. Uh, it just seems to me that that's what it is. Uh, but anyway, when it does happen, it will come quickly. And he says there's no, not been anything like it before or nothing will ever be like it again this time of Jacob's trouble. And when we connect chapter, Jeremiah 30 with Matthew 24, we know that this great tribulation is called a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time where Satan will use the Antichrist to do everything he can to destroy Israel again. This doesn't minimize the persecution that the Gentiles and the Jews face who follow Jesus. So God's plan through the ages is noted as Jacob's time of trouble. That's what he's talking about delivering them from. He says, but you shall be saved out of it. Some say from it, some say out of it. And here's what he means. It means out from within it. In other words, you'll be going through this time of tribulation. You'll be going through this time of trouble. And from that, from within that, I will pull you out. It'd be the idea if you were in a furnace somewhere and someone pulled you out of something. Or maybe you're in a burning car and someone pulled you out. You still had that experience of having that accident, of having that car explode. But someone saved you and pulled you out. And that's what he's telling Israel. He's telling Judah. And he's telling us today is I will pull you out from that. I will save you from within that. He's not saying that he'll protect us so we don't have to go through. 
through it. Which, by the way, don't you find it interesting that the storms that God delivers us from before we go into them are not nearly as impactful on our life as if God lets us go into the storm and then he snatches us out? Because then you see the hand of God. You see the power of God. And you realize God never does leave me. He never does forsake me. And from the midst of all of that anxiety, in the midst of all that trouble, in the midst of all that pain, in the midst of all that depression, God pulls me out of it. I'm waiting for God to pull our country out of the depression that we are in. And uh, But again, it, it boils down to us. We've got to get on our knees before God and ha- renew our minds and renew our hearts. It's not up to lost people to get our country where it needs to be. It's up to us. It's up to the people of God to get their hearts right with God and then, let, and then trust it to God and let God do with it as God sees fit. He said, but you shall be saved out of it. Now, in, chapter, in verse 8 through 11, I want you to notice God books delivers promise, but he also delivers blessings. He says, and it shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from their neck, and I will tear off their bonds, and strangers no longer will make them their slaves. Now, see, that's one of the reasons we know that he is also talking prophetically about in the future. Because even after this, Israel has had time and time again where strangers had overtook them and, and had made slaves of them, how they have been hated around the world. He said, but there's a day coming where that will no longer take place. And that's what he says in verse 9. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. Boy, this is great on David their king. Who I will rise up again for them. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant declares the Lord. And do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring to the land of their captivity. And Jacob will return and be quiet and be at ease or be at peace. And no one will make him afraid. That day hadn't come yet. Israel still lives in fear of of, of Hezbollah and everybody else launching rockets into Israel. But that day's coming. God's promised it. He's already delivered the promises. He promised them from from their captivity. Now he's going to promise them at the end of time. These things will happen. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you. For I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely. Why? Because he's going to discipline us and discipline them. But I will chasten you justly, fairly. And I will by no means leave you unpunished. In other words, God will punish us. Just like when you have to punish your child. You don't want to punish your child. But there are times you have to because it's for their good. It's for their betterment because they need to learn how to do something or how to act in a particular uh, situation or a particular way. And you don't want to do it, but you have to. And that's why God's long-suffering. God doesn't discipline his people until he absolutely has to. But here's what he says. But I'm not going to destroy you like I'm going to destroy the rest of the nations. The rest of the nations, your enemies, Israel, I am going to destroy. Notice he says, I will break their yoke from off of your neck. Now, we need to remember in Jeremiah chapter 28, a false prophet had previously preached about a yoke being broken uh, on the necks of Israel, saying this yoke's going to be broken, and you're going to get out of captivity real quick, real soon. We know that was a false prophet. So here's what Jeremiah's doing. Jeremiah said, let me tell you about the real yoke. There is a yoke that's on your neck, but in the end, you'll understand this, because God himself will break the yoke. In other words, nobody will ever hold you in captivity again. They, the, no more strangers will make slaves out of you. So this points to the, a greater time than just the, when they came back from the captivity of Babylon. And it says, and they shall serve the Lord their God. Instead of being slaves to foreigners, Israel and Judah will be servants and they will be faithful to Yahweh and ultimately to the Messiah. And then look at the next verse. And David, their king. Now, most commentators think that when David, the king, rises from the dead, this is talking about the, the, the Messiah. He's going to rule and reign over them as their Messiah. And there's, there's evidence to support that. But there's also evidence to support a little different theory. Isaiah 55, verses 3 and 4, and Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24 And then Hosea chapter 3 verse 5 said that the resurrected David, the the past king of Israel, because in the millennium we will all be raised with Christ. David, the king of Israel, will be raised with Christ. The Bible tells us that we will rule and reign with him. Jesus Christ is the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords, but it says that those faithful, the believers, and some will be from Israel, some will be from Judah, some will be from us. We'll be ruling and reigning, so it would be as though maybe, you know, 
Charles Stanley, because I'm trying to think of names y'all might know, might, might be over Georgia or something. And some other uh, uh, strong Christian that's been faithful to Christ would be over, you know, South Carolina. But here's what he's saying. If this theory is right, and I think there's some evidence to back it up. I can see both of them. But here's what he's saying, and you got to get the, the, the nuance of this. He's telling Israel here. He's telling Judah, you know the king you love? King David, you, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we, we wanted David back. I mean, David was the great king of Israel. He'll say, his portion is over you. Now, you'll talk about God keeping a promise. You want to see love that God has for his people. They wanted David back. And he says, in eternity, everybody's going to fall under me. But under me, we'll have different people will have different areas of rule. He says, David, you will be over Israel again. Israel, your king, is coming back. Now, I see both, I've, I've researched this, and I've, I've seen scripture that supports both views. I don't know which it is, but I know this. I know either way, whether it's the Messiah coming back and saying, I'm coming to, to, to rule over you and to guarantee you all these things, or if it's the Messiah saying, I'm going to give David, the Israel, as his portion because you've loved, you've loved David so much. If that's the case, Scripture would certainly support it. Maybe by next year, this time, I'll know which, one I, which way I swing to. But the point is this. God is such a God of love that he's going to do everything he can that's for our best interest. And notice what he says in verse 10. He says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord. God is foretelling him of a time when there's going to be a great catastrophe. But in spite of all of it, he says, Don't fear. Don't be afraid. And that's why I, I try to tell people now when I'm trying to minister to them, Don't be afraid. Again, I, you know, I know you've heard me say it <laughs> probably two million times, but it's true. Nobody's going to take my life one second before God wants it. And I'm not going to extend it one second after he wants it. When God's ready for Ed Pruitt, Ed's going. Several years ago, I, uh, on, on one of the, the trips I took from Southeastern Seminary, it was at a, at a time when, well, we were going to Iraq, and, and a lot of people tried to talk me out of it. And I, I said, you know, God has burdened my heart, and God has told me, and I handpicked from the students I had uh, five more students, five men to go with me, and so 2010, we went to Iraq, and uh, God did some amazing things, saving people and, and, and just spreading the word. And there were people who thought I was crazy. I'm so thankful that my boss, Emer Kaner, said, when I asked him, I said, hey, listen, we've been, we got the opportunity to go to Iraq. What do you think? He says, you're the missions director. It's up to you. Do what you want to do. I trust you. And so we prayed about it, and, uh, and we went, and, and we went back in 2012. But I can't tell you how many people called me and wrote me letters and sent me text messages and emails and, and are you crazy? I mean, do you realize what's going on? I mean, you know, in, in 2010, Mosul was the hotbed and I was 30 miles from Mosul and, and sharing the gospel with people and watching. But here's the point. Just like after 9-11, Debbie and I were flying out on, on 9-16 and people were like, are, do, I mean, is it safe? Again, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 18 years old. And from that point till now, whenever he wants me, I'm his. And that's what it boils down to. So I don't live in depression. I don't live concerned about tomorrow because I know who holds tomorrow. It doesn't mean I'm not wise. I try to be wise about things. But I see so many people today, they're depressed and they're down in the dumps. And I just want to say, don't be down in the dumps. You've got a God that loves you, who has saved you, who's made plans for you. And this is what he's going to do for you. Verses 12 through 17, God's book defends the defenseless. There are those out there who cannot defend themselves. But aren't you thankful that God does? He said, for thus says the Lord, your wound is incurable and your injury is serious. There's no one to plead your cause. There's no healing for your sore. No recovery for you, and all your lovers have forgotten you. They do not even seek after you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy and with the punishment of the cruel one, because of your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. Why then do you cry out over your injury? Your pain is incurable. Because your iniquity is so great and your sins are so numerous, I have done these things to you. Verse 16, Therefore, all who devour you will be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them will go into captivity. And those who plunder you and those who uh, will be plundered, and all who prey upon you, I will give them for prey. 
And then look at the change in verse 17. For I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of all your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying it is Zion, and no one cares for her. Then these verses, Jeremiah describes the situation in three metaphors. First, he says, you're sick. You've got a terminal illness. If you've got a terminal illness, nobody's going to be able to help you. But God says, I'll heal you. Second, he says, you're like a defendant in a court case. You're guilty of something. By the way, the wages of sin is death. <coughs> that is a court transaction. I have sinned, therefore I deserve to die. But then there's no one to defend me until Christ steps forward. And God says, I will defend you. Third, he's like an abandoned lover. He says, you went after, you were playing the part of a harlot to all these other gods. Where are they? They're not coming back to you. They don't care about you anymore. But God says, that's okay. I'll rescue you. So there's plenty of other lovers out there, but they won't come back. In other words, Judah's fate, Jacob's fate is dismal. But God says, I'll act in your behalf. I'll be your physician and I'll heal you. I'll be your defendant and also be your protector. Verse 15, he says, why do you cry out for your injury or your affliction? Rather than crying out, they were crying and saying, oh, I have died. He says, you shouldn't be crying that out. What you should be crying out is, oh, I've sinned. It doesn't matter if we die. It matters. He said, did you sin? We shouldn't be crying. I'm undone. We should be crying. I've done foolishly. I have not acted the way God has taught me to act. Because the iniquity is great and your sins are numerous, I've done these things. You, God reminded, you brought this on yourself. It wasn't that, man, I had to run a bad luck. You know, it wasn't you had to run a bad luck. Well, I don't know what happened, but no, God says, I want you to know something. You sinned. I brought this calamity on you, but I, because I love you, I'm not going to completely destroy you. I'm going to restore you and not to destroy you. I love verse 17. For I will restore you to health. I will bring you healing to your wounds, declares the Lord. Why? Because they've called you an outcast. They say it is Zion and no one cares for her. And God says, I care for her. And then in verses 18 through 24, God closes this book out by, by saying he restores and he brings justice. Verse 18, thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, and I will have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin, and the palace will stand on its rightful place. From them will proceed thanksgivings and the voice of those who celebrate, and I will multiply them, and I will not diminish them. I will also honor them or glorify them, and they will not be insignificant. Their children also will be as formerly, and the congregation shall be blessed and shall be established before me, and I will punish all their oppressors, and the leader shall come from them, and their ruler shall come forth from their midst, and I will bring him near, and he shall approach me, for who shall risk his life to approach me, declares the Lord. And then verse 22, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold the tempest of the Lord, the wrath has gone forth, the sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not be turned back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand this. And of course, that's another part of how do we know he's talking about the end of time? Because he says to them, in the latter days. Yes, God made promises to Judah and to Israel. He was going to bring them back out of captivity. We know from, from Scripture he did do that. He promised them. Remember, he said, and in that day when I bring you back, last, referring back to last week, he said, in that day when I bring you back, you will turn to me with your whole heart, and I will hear you. I will be found. You will have access to God again. And that's what we need. Is there one thing we need in this country is we need access to God. The, 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 the hope for our future does not rest in any political party it rests in jesus christ we need our country to turn back to god more so than they've ever turned to god but he says in the end days you will understand the picture here of the restoration of these virtues is rich it's encouraging but notice the completeness of the language in other words he's not saying i'm going to give part of it back to you in this description beginning in verse 18 if you look at all that god's going to it's a complete restoration god says i took this from you and i'm giving it back to you not in part I'm giving it all back to you. But beyond what I'm giving back to you in that last day, then you'll understand why. There's a day coming when Israel will no longer be laughed at. There'll be no one shooting rockets at Israel. There'll be no one uh, that, that uh, will be trying to make slaves of them. 
Never again. That day is coming. It's not here yet, but it's coming. He says, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob. The emphasis here is God's promising total restoration. The city will be built on its ruin. In other words, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of God. And when you think about it, it's just not right for it to be destroyed. And God said, there's coming a day when it will not be destroyed. The palace even will be in its rightful place. And God says, and I will honor or I will glorify them. He will put honor on those everywhere. There, there are places today around the world, and a lot of people hate God's people, and we're God's people to hate us too. Uh, that's evident. But there's coming a day, whether you're Israel or Judah or you're God's people, the Gentiles that have been saved have been grafted in to Israel. Whoever you are that's a true follower of Jesus Christ and, and of the Messiah, there's a day coming when no one else will make fun of you. No one else will threaten you. No one else will, will, will cut your head off for believing in Jesus Christ. It says their leaders shall be one of them. Their rulers shall come forth in the midst. Maybe the ESV is best translation of verse 21. For It says their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler will come out of their midst, and I will make him draw near, and he will approach me. For who could dare of himself approach me? When he says, I will bring him near, and he shall approach me, this is emphasizing the way this is phrased. A very unique ruler would come and draw near unto Yahweh, and it's talking about the Messiah. And the reason being that he's unique, he's not only a king, he's the priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is a king for his people, and he is a priest to his people. Who is your advocate between you and God, Jesus, the Messiah? He's the priest. He probably, he's the only one that can, that, can, that can fulfill both roles. Who can, who can approach God? Nobody except the Messiah. And he approaches as a priest on your behalf and on my behalf, and he says, you'll get honor and you'll get glory for this. Why? Because from your midst will come. Well, he did. If you read through the genealogy in Matthew and see, see the lineage of Jesus, he came through the line of David. He came from their midst. So here God is shared with them, there's one coming in the future that will stand for you. For who would risk life approach to me? We covered that. Then he says there's a sweeping tempest and it will burst on the head of the wicked. Here's what he's saying in those verses. He says, listen, I want you to realize salvation is coming deliverance is coming. There's a day when you're never going to be, uh, have to worry again. Nobody's going to ever oppress you again. Those, that day will come. But in the meantime, my judgment's already on the way. I want you to be aware of it. It's on the way. And it's like a hurricane. It's like a whirlwind, if you will, a tornado. You can't stop it. It's going to do what it's going to do. God's judgment is going to do what it's going to do. But God says, in the latter days, you'll understand. God reminds us in this chapter that in the latter days, is when we'll find the ultimate fulfillment. God did promise Israel and Judah things that was fulfilled. We see it in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. That, that was promised, was, was, was given. But there's more promises that are given after that. Promises given to you and promises given to me. And those promises, just like all the other promises of God that have already been fulfilled, they will be fulfilled. There's no reason for, hope, for, for, for people not to have hope. There's no reason for people to be depressed and to be down. Why? Because we've got a God who's going to take care of us. And if we stray from him, he doesn't abandon us. He doesn't forsake us. He will discipline us because he loves us, because he wants what's best for us. He's going to wait till he absolutely has to, but then he's going to discipline us. But he will not destroy us. But our enemies, he will destroy. And that's what he says. So what can I take home with me this week? Well, six quick things you can take home with you. One is God provides hope in a time of darkness. Israel and Judah was at the darkest. These were dark, dark days. They had played the harlot and, and went seeking after other gods until God finally had to have Israel and Judah both taken into captivity by the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Seventy years they were going to be in captivity. Seventy years they were going to suffer. And evidently during that 70 years, it was going to be like a woman giving birth. Now, I don't know what that's like, but I was with Debbie when my first one was born. It didn't seem like it was a real fun experience, okay? In fact, I was holding her hand as the doctor was, was delivering Byron, and uh, he says, uh, Ed, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. He said, okay, I just want to make sure. He said, I had a 300-pound wrestler 
uh, passed out on me last week, and he said I couldn't get him off the floor. I said, no, I'm fine. As long as it ain't my blood. Yeah, if it's my blood, I see one drop, it's like, I'm gone. You know, but if you're bleeding, I, I, can, I can handle it. So um, anyway, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of fun. But So Israel was in a time of, of turmoil and in pain, but God shows up and God delivers them. And when we're in the midst of our turmoil and our pain, God will show up and God will deliver us. The second thing is God's our healer, even if we're terminally ill. You know, when you go to the doctor, and, the, and, and this happens more and more regular these days. You know, used to it was, well, you got five years. Now sometimes it's like you've got two weeks, you've got a month, you've got three months. I mean, what, what do you do? But yet God's still our healer. First church I pastored, it was a, a lady who had gotten cancer, and the doctor had told her, you, I mean, just a few months, three months at the most, get your affairs in order. And she came before the church and asked to have uh, hands laid on her and anoint her with oil. And she lived for another five years. She went back to the doctor. The doctor goes, this does not make sense. He pulled all the, the, the research together from before and pulled all it. And he says, this is like two totally different people. Well, what happened? Well, she knows what happened. God healed her. Listen, you may be terminally ill. God can still heal you. And by the way, we are terminally ill. We're sick. Because we, without God, we're sick. But God can heal us spiritually and physically and emotionally. God's our advocate in legal matters. The wages of sin is death, and we deserve to die. There's a penalty there. But aren't you thankful that Jesus stands there and says, Father, this was with me. I paid his price. Go ahead and let him in. He's our advocate. God still loves us and stands with us even when we've been unfaithful. Aren't you thankful that your salvation isn't based on your faithfulness? It's based on his. And that's how we know all the other world religions are wrong because every other religion in the world is about what can I do in order to get to heaven? What can I do in order to be right with God? And it breaks my heart to see Hindus who, who try to, to worship 300 million manifestations of Brahma. And they're doing all these kind of things to try to be right. And you know they're going to die and spend eternity separated from God. It breaks your heart. But God stands with us even when we're unfaithful. It's not what I have to do for God. It's what he did for me 2,000 years ago. And the fifth thing is, is God's restoration is complete. Aren't you thankful God doesn't just do things halfway? You know, God just didn't put, put a patch on it. He doesn't put a Band-Aid on it when you just lost an arm. God completely restores. God completely heals. And last, God deals appropriately with our enemies. We've got enemies in this world. There are people who hate you because you're a Christian. There are people who make fun of you because you came to church this morning. There are people who hate you. They hated Israel. They hated Judah. And by the way, you know why they hated Israel and Judah? Because they hated God. It wasn't Israel and Judah. It was God they hated because he is sovereign. And they can't defeat him. And from time past until God binds Satan forever, Satan will hate God because he can't control him. Thank you.